This program is brought to you by Emory University. I have the pleasure of introducing um, Julio Trinos, who's an associate professor at UPenn. Um, Julio has been a collaborator now for a couple of years, so I'm extremely excited to have him join us. Um, Julio did his cardiology fellowship at Jackson Memorial at the University of Miami School of Medicine. Um, he then went on to complete fellowship in CMR and CT at UPenn, um, as well as a PhD in arterial aging and hemodynamics in Belgium. Uh, his lab focuses on the role of arterial dysfunction and integrated mechanisms of cardiovascular disease, particularly related to HEF-PEF using integrated omics, including proteomics. More recently, Julio has been studying the cardiovascular consequences of COVID-19. He served as co-PI of the multi-center replace COVID trial, which looked at um, discontinuation versus continuation of ACE inhibitors and ARBs in COVID, and is also the PI of the multi-center Furman trial, which will look at phenofibrate as a metabolic intervention for COVID-19. So we're really excited to have you join us, Julio, and teach us about your work. So thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Elena, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here um, talking about this topic, which, as we were discussing, has been a favorite of mine for many years. Um, these are my disclosures. OK, so I think when approaching um, um, uh, the role of arterial stiffness, uh, we're thinking really about aortic stiffness, right? The aorta is the most elastic artery in the body. And it's the artery that ages and that <clears throat> suffers an impact from various risk factors and, and so forth. We're not talking so much about muscular arteries. I think that's, I just wanna get that out first. When we generically refer to arterial stiffness, generally we're talking about large artery stiffness. Muscular arteries are important as we'll see as a therapeutic target to compensate for some of the abnormalities uh, in the aorta. Now the aorta of course has a huge hemodynamic role, not only as a conduit, but as a uh, buffer for uh, pulsations and pressure and flow. The ventricle is an intermittent pump, so the aorta and the rest of the arterial tree are in charge of delivering quasi-continuous flow at the capillary level. So the, and the aorta is really, as you can see here, the main determinant of uh, buffering of these pulsations. But this goes beyond the simple compliance that just accommodates volume with each heartbeat. There are uh, wave conduction and reflection phenomena associated with this. Um, uh, a, a, a compliant aorta, a healthy aorta, will exhibit a low pulse wave velocity. That's just the nature of stiff materials or non-stiff materials. So, so pulse wave velocity increases with stiffness of the wall. And um, when there's slow pulse wave velocity, wave reflections, which are inevitable, they occur in everyone um, at any point in life, uh, will uh, return to the left ventricle in diastole when the aortic valves close, and thus um, they will promote coronary perfusion during diastole. But when the aorta gets degenerated, uh, stiff, and so forth, as in the right here, um, pulse wave velocity increases, and there's a premature wave reflection arrival to the LV. And we'll, we'll go through how that's bad for the left ventricle in a number of ways. Um, so that's um, ventricular vascular coupling, if you will. But there's another um, whole a set of mechanisms uh, related to just the uh, excessive pulsatility that results from aortic stiffening and how that pulsatility gets transmitted to peripheral organs, especially low resistance beds such as the kidney, brain, placenta, um, um, Langerhans, um, islets in the pancreas and so forth. Um, all right, so um, let's start with um, uh, this latter mechanism um, of uh, pulsatility penetration into the target organs. Here, um, again, we're talking about low resistance, low um, high flow organs, such as the brain and the kidney. We'll talk, we'll talk about the heart later. But I think when, when we think about this pulsatility transmission to vascular beds, we have to be thinking about uh, resistance and flow uh, in those vascular beds. Um, now, resistance vessels, as you could imagine, drop not only mean pressure distally, but also pulsatility. So it is the vascular beds that exhibit low resistance and high blood flow um, that will be most uh, exposed to excessive pulsatility as a result of aortic stiffening or large artery stiffening. And um, in what I did in this graph is try to 
uh, plot the um, flow and resistance. As you can imagine, flow and resistance are inversely um, uh, proportional to each other. Um, remember, mean pressure is the same pretty much everywhere in the body, unless you have stenosis somewhere. But mean pressure uh, is the same all the way to the to the resistance arterials anywhere other than hydrostatic uh, pressure differences depending on your body position and so forth. Um, so what really regulates local flow relative to other organs is local resistance. And so organs that require a lot of flow must lower their resistance to um, to be able to to um, uh, divert um, a higher proportion of the cardiac output towards that particular bed. And so here I've plotted resistance and flow and organs on the right are the ones that have the least resistance and the highest flow per 100 grams of tissue. And of course, uh, you see the target organs plotted right here, the kidney, the placenta, the brain. Now, uh, you may think the brain is all the way to the left here. A couple of points. First of all, most organs don't even fall in this scale. They'll be just too, too big to even plot, you know, skeletal muscle, skin, uh, gut, and so forth. They're, they're really all the way to the left. So these, uh, to, uh, to uh, some degree or, or another, are high flow, uh, low resistance organs. And the brain uh, will activate specific areas um, depending on neuronal activity. So even though this is bulk or average brain flow, of course, specific areas of the brain will have acute increases in flow that really shift this all the way to the right. The brain, really, we have to think uh, about it with, as a high flow organ and its position here, we have to take with a grain of salt. But again, clearly kidney, placenta, the liver, even though most of the liver flow comes from the portal vein, about a third comes from the hepatic artery. And, and, and that alone uh, places it at, at, um, at a, a high flow, uh, low resistance position here. Um, but, um, and I want to talk about the heart later. I mean, the heart is certainly um, a high flow, low resistance bed. Um, the myocardium requires a lot of blood flow, but um, the, my, the left ventricle and the right ventricle compress the capillaries during systole, such that really um, pulsatility in, in the coronary microvasculature does not occur as a result of aortic stiffening because the vessels are compressed. So the mechanisms of heart damage from aortic stiffening are different. They relate to ventricular arterial coupling and diastolic pressure gradients for a coronary flow, which we'll um, uh, review in a little bit more detail. Um, now you see the pancreas here. This is an interesting issue. The, the pancreas uh, as a whole organ doesn't really have um, um, uh, flow rates as high as kidney, for example, but uh, if, if you just go to the endocrine islets, where all the endocrine cells are, they are true glomeruli. They are really just a lot of vessels, and all these endocrine cells surround those vessels, and blood flow in those islets are actually higher um, per gram of tissue than, say, kidney or any other organs you see here. So, so um, the pancreatic islets are, are truly very, very high flow, very low resistance organs, and, and, and this has to do... Uh, we believe with, with uh, some recent data associating aortic stiffening with metabolic dysfunction, as we'll review. Um, now, the carotid body has a, a very high uh, flow um, because it needs it for sensing mechanisms and so forth, but it's unclear that the microvasculature here really is uh, exposed to excessive pulsatility because there's also systolic pressure on the other side of the wall uh, because it's right on the arterial wall. So, um, so again, just going from this plot of flow resistance um, in various organs, you can then go to, well, what are the potential consequences? And that's what we're going to get into now. So in the brain, um, aortic stiffening has been associated with um, a lot of abnormalities, both in imaging as well as in uh, cognitive tests. Um, in the presence of high pulsatility, um, uh, there has been reports that clearly associate this with lacunar infarcts, white matter hyperintensities, even amyloid deposition, um, as well as in large vertical robbing spaces. Um, interestingly, there is uh, increasing recognition that uh, uh, dementias are not truly pure. In most cases, they have a vascular component, even when they are classified as Alzheimer's. So, uh, dementia of the elderly definitely um, um, has a strong vascular component. And, and we think, um, due to increasing evidence, that aortic stiffening and abnormal pulsatile hemodynamics 
and vascular damage consequent to it uh, play a role. In the kidney, this has been known for a long time. Um, uh, certainly, there's a close interaction between the kidney and the aorta. Um, uh, the, on one hand, as we've discussed, increased aortic stiffness can lead to increased pulsatility and glomerular damage. But when uh, chronic kidney disease occurs, um, it's associated with uh, various abnormalities in bone, mineral dysregulation, RAS activation, impaired salt excretion, et cetera, and that feeds back positively uh, and increases aortic stiffening, calcification, et cetera. And, and so there's really a, a vicious uh, cycle here. Um, and it's long been known that aortic stiffening is, is a strong predictor of outcomes in patients with CKD, especially with advanced uh, CKD. Um, and of course, a lot of risk factors affect both the aorta and the uh, kidneys uh, simultaneously, aging, diabetes, inflammation, et cetera. Let's talk about metabolic dysregulation. This is interesting. We've known for a while, just based on hemodynamic principles, that aortic stiffening leads to hypertension. In fact, pulse pressure is in itself a metric of aortic stiffness for any given stroke volume delivered to the, um, to the systemic circulation. So isolated systolic hypertension, which as you know, is the most common type of hypertension. And it's the, uh, the one that's associated with the greatest cardiovascular risk in the elderly is in itself a direct consequence of arterial stiffening. Um, and of course, as you would expect, arterial stiffening precedes hypertension. Uh, it's not just that the high blood pressure distends the aorta more and makes it more stiff. There is such a phenomenon, the, the more distended the aorta, the stiffer it behaves for any intrinsic material properties. So there, there was some controversy about this, but this is an, an interesting study from the Framingham cohort that clearly showed, uh, uh, shows that uh, you, Aortic stiffening measured by carotid femoral pulse wave velocity precedes hypertension. Um, and so, um, as you would expect, but you know, let me take you back to this plot where um, uh, endocrine um, uh, pancreatic tissue receives very high flow and it's a low, very low resistance organ. And recently, there's been a, a very large cohort study from China that has demonstrated that in fact, the similar, uh, a similar phenomenon occurs for diabetes as for hypertension. That is uh, when you plot a, a, um, a measure of pulse wave velocity, this is brachial ankle. So it's not purely aortic, uh, but it is a surrogate of aortic stiffening. Uh, you can predict diabetes, uh, but not the other way around. Meaning the arterial stiffening that, that is associated with diabetes is not just a consequence of diabetes. In fact, it precedes diabetes and predicts the uh, incidence of new onset diabetes. And this is a very large study. And in fact, there are previous data from JKs and other studies and trials that clearly support this when you use pulse pressure or some other metrics of, uh, of large heart rate stiffening. And in fact, we um, have just reproduced these results in the Framingham Heart Study. So it is true that uh, aortic stiffening um, precedes diabetes, and there may be a mechanism. Uh, this is an independent relationship. Um, whether this is truly causal remains to be seen. Of course, there are many things that lead to diabetes, but um, uh, dysregulation of uh, glucagon and insulin secretion in the pancreas, which has to do with vascular function, this perfusion of cells in the endocrine islets is, is very highly regulated and sequential. Um, and, and there's just not enough research about it, but the little research there is strongly suggests that the vascular function in the pancreas plays a huge, microvascular function in the pancreas, plays an important role um, in, in uh, metabolic and endocrine regulation. There could be also an effect in the liver, explaining these findings. Again, the liver is also a high flow, low resistance organ. Uh, it's, there's a, several studies associate um, uh, NASH with aortic stiffening as well. But again, the, the, role, the role here, the, the true causal and mechanistic role remains unclear. I think this epidemiologic finding should uh, lead to, to better mechanistic studies. Um, so this is a summary of target organs and, and, and consequences of aortic stiffening. We've already discussed this. Again, brain and kidney are much more established. Uh, subclinical brain pathology, cognitive impairment, dementia in the brain, chronic kidney disease in the kidney, proteinuria in the kidney, uh, in the, um, also preeclampsia and intrauterine growth restriction have both been associated with increased maternal 
large artery stiffness. There are reasons to believe that there may be a, a consequence on, on, the, on, the, on testosterone secretion. Um, again, endocrine cells in, in the testicles are also high flow, low resistance beds, but there's not a lot of data here. It's, it's worth looking into, however, because the mechanisms are there. Some data in animals suggest that this may be the case. Uh, what you can see here is that aortic stiffening goes well beyond the heart. It, it, it causes a lot of systemic abnormalities that conspire, uh, not only in, their, um, in the absence of heart disease, but in the presence of heart disease and heart failure to lead to comorbidities and trouble for heart failure patients. And, and, and this may be uh, underlying all the comorbidities that are heart failure, especially elderly heart failure patients present with. Now let's talk about the heart now. The heart um, is affected by arterial stiffening, not so much through pulsatility penetration as the peripheral target organs, but through abnormal ventricular arterial coupling. So let's start reviewing just some normal physiology here. So when the ventricle uh, pumps and delivers um, a pulse to the aorta, the blood is incompressible. So the pulse travels through the wall and eventually bounces back. There are millions of tiny wave reflections. This is represented here as a single reflected wave. In reality, there are millions that merge into a single reflected wave that arrives at the aorta, at the proximal aorta, and merges with the forward wave, such that your pulse um, wave is actually um, a sum of the two, forward and backward. In fact, there's a little bit, there's plenty of re-reflection of the ventricle as well. Uh, so reflections really go back and forth. But that primary reflection coming back in diastole is what you see in, nor in, in, in healthy people. And we'll see what happens when this gets premature. Again, under ideal conditions, low pulse wave velocity, reflections occur, low pulse wave, pulse wave velocity on the way back, and arrival of the reflector wave in diastole. And that leads to um, augmentation of, um, of coronary perfusion. But since the aortic valve is closed, we do not see an increased afterload in the heart or an abnormal afterload because those reflections are predominantly diastolic. That's what you want. Now, when the aorta gets degenerated and stiff, like in this case, we have an increased pulse wave velocity. The wave travels forward and, and backward in, uh, with high speed through the wall. This is not the same as blood flow velocity. This is pulse wave velocity through the wall. Uh, and uh, that leads to um, systolic augmentation of pulse pressure, merging of forward and backward waves in systole, and that uh, re-reflections uh, uh, in the pumping LV, such that your pulse pressure really grows and, and you have systolic hypertension, but more importantly, an abnormal systolic load sequence, that is excessive mid to late systolic load, for any given early systolic load. And this is important. It's not just about absolute load, it's about when that load occurs. Um, the ventricle in, in general can um, tolerate rather large amounts of load very early in systole. Um, and uh, when, when you selectively load the ventricle after that, after the onset of relaxation, which at, at the myocardial level, at the sarcomere level, actually takes place very early during ejection, um, you, will, you will get into trouble. Um, there's a, a lot of evidence that, leads, that, that uh, leads us to believe that mid to late systolic load um, leads to hypertrophy, fibrosis, and various other uh, um, adverse consequences like we'll discuss. Uh, and, and this is just a summary. Uh, I think a list of some of those studies. I don't think this is even a comprehensive list. This is just one that's probably biased to some of the studies that I'm most familiar with and or have, have participated in myself, but, but there's certainly very good evidence in animals that uh, it, selective mid to late systolic loading can lead to LV hypertrophy, LV fibrosis, acute diastolic dysfunction as well. So it's remodeling and dysfunction. Um, and, and some of these findings in animals have been shown by even more than one group, but very highly consistently so. In humans, um, plenty of epidemiologic evidence links wave reflection to left ventricular hypertrophy measured by MRI, regression of LVH when you treat people for high blood pressure, 
people who regress their reflections, if you will, or who blunt their reflections in response to therapy are the same people that end up regressing their LDH. Um, evidence linking it to diastolic dysfunction in the general population and in clinical populations. More recently, we've shown an association with left atrial dysfunction, left atrial strain measured by MRI. There's certainly an association with HFPAF, uh, very careful studies in the cath lab, cath lab by Tom Weber in Austria have, have shown that half the patients, in fact, have increased wave reflection. Um, uh, and in fact, they can use reflection metrics to help classify or predict the presence of half path. Um, data from the Mayo Clinic clearly indicates that um, um, uh, increased uh, wave reflection during exercise is, has a role in abnormal adaptations to exercise and, and correlates with aerobic capacity. There's old data that shows the same thing for half ref from Lasky back in the 80s. Um, we've shown in a population of aortic stenosis patients undergoing uh, aortic valve replacement that LV fibrosis um, measured by MRI to a mapping is uh, uh, closely related to reflection magnitude. And interestingly, uh, reflection magnitude predicts who's gonna get better in terms of KCCQ scores after AVR. So if you're left with prominent reflections, you can fix all you want in the aortic valve, you're not going to get as uh, you're not going to improve as much as somebody who has good arteries once you relieve the the trans aortic uh, pressure gradient. So um, very interesting data in aortic stenosis as well, um, and uh, we have data showing that it's associated with incident heart failure risk in the in the MESA cohort. This is the study we uh, inferred wave reflection from radial aortic pressure waveforms. We didn't measure flow, which is the best way of doing it here, but we used a physiologic flow approach, which closely approximates uh, reflection magnitude. And we stratified people into turtles, and you can see a clear increase in the risk of incident heart failure um, by turtles of reflection magnitude. And when we plotted this against standard predictors, and, and we looked at wall statistics and uh, Bayesian information criteria and, and so forth, and AKEK information criteria, uh, and changes in the C index or the under, uh, under the ROC curve or, or equivalent for Cox model, which is survival analysis. All these metrics tells you how strong the predictor is, how, how well it would classify people and how much it adds to other um, existing predictors. And, and you can see, I don't want to spend too much time in this table, but by far reflection magnitude in this analysis was the strongest predictor of modifiable predictor of heart failure. Uh, in some cases, the only thing that was stronger than, than, than reflection magnitude was age, which is non-modifiable, but certainly superior to blood pressure, diabetes, BMI, and so forth, or even systolic and diastolic blood pressure together. Um, so this is sort of a summary of what we've gone through in terms of the impact of wave reflection and arterial stiffening. Uh, wave reflection is good, is inevitable, is part of life, can't avoid it. Uh, wave reflections, but you want them in diastole, promoting coronary perfusion as on the left. You certainly don't want uh, prominent wave reflections in systole, promoting myocardial fibrosis, hypertrophy, and dysfunction, and, and heart failure risk. So this is all the result, or mostly the result of aortic stiffening. However, I want to point out here that muscular arteries can actually modulate the apparent uh, distance to reflection sites and delay the reflected wave. Uh, if, despite the presence of a high pulse wave velocity, and that provides some therapeutic opportunities, as we'll discuss later. Now, um, and uh, let, let me just switch gears here. And I, we were just discussing with Alana earlier today how studying the arteries has led me to take a strong interest in this in the syndrome of half path, um, a true syndrome. It's as you know, it's not a disease. It has it has probably mixed ideologies. We understand some of them now, but not all of them. And and it's a bit of a mixed bag of, 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 of disease there, but, but it's a clear syndrome. It exists is the most common form of heart failure these days. And arterial uh, abnormalities have been identified by, by um, this panel assembled by, by the NHLBI uh, um, as, as one of the key areas or key priorities to, um, to discern in, in half -path. Um, Another important priority has been discerning the heterogeneity uh, of HFPEF. As I mentioned, HFPEF is a syndrome. It has heterogeneity, uh, mechanistically, ideologically. Um, and even if you, you know, exclude amyloid and, and whatnot, you're still going to be left with heterogeneity. Um, and and <clears throat> what we did in, in this study that I'm about to present 
is we looked at that heterogeneity using cluster analysis. What we did is try to, cluster analysis is a statistical method. You can use more classic statistical um, methods or more novel machine learning methods, but regardless of the method, what you're trying to do with cluster analysis is take advantage of similarities between individuals that group them in more even groups that are again, similar within each, uh, within, but different from other groups. So, so you end up really with more uh, uniform clusters or subgroups of people. And that's what we apply in the TACA trial. Uh, and, and what we um, identified in this trial were three phenogroups of patients, um, which we call phenogroup one, two, or three. Um, these had been done in, in single center cohorts before for, by Sanjeev Shah, for example. And in fact, the, the, the groups look roughly similar, except for, for this phenogroup group that we identified in Topka that I'll talk about uh, in, a little, in a little while. Uh, but, you know, just, uh, I just want to point out I'm not saying the Topka analysis, but um, phenogroups groups have been identified in various uh, other cohorts. Um, in this Topka analysis, uh, the phenogroups groups that we identified where this phenogroup group one of younger, uh, leaner male participants, uh, elderly, predominantly women uh, participants or female participants, and middle-aged to older, obese, predominantly male participants. So we've given them little icons to facilitate presentations, but clearly these are not just all men and these are not just all women, uh, but there's some predominance of, of sex there. Um, and the first thing I want to show you is the survival, very different survival by phenogroup. This phenogroup of the younger, leaner male uh, predominant uh, uh, individuals has uh, had very good outcomes relative to the other groups. Uh, the little old lady phenotype and the uh, obese uh, middle-aged uh, to older uh, male phenotype that had actually the worst outcome in this, in this trial. And then what we did after um, defining the phenogroups was to characterize the phenotypes um, and uh, this is a summary of those phenotypes. Uh, we not only um, looked at echocardiographic data and some uh, tonometry data that have been acquired, but we did proteomics that I'll show you in a second. But what I want to show you here is the, um, the phenotypic uh, characterization of these phenogroups. The younger lean male had normal LVs, normal arteries, normal diastolic function by echo, normal uh, roughly normal or lower natriuretic peptides. They had mild symptoms and they were smokers, um, a larger proportion of smoking in that group. We think these people had lung disease and there are other reasons to believe that. They, were, they really didn't have true half pep. They were enrolled predominantly in Russia, Georgia, by the way. There were some in the US, but they were enrolled predominantly in Russia, Georgia. The little old lady Fina group exhibited concentric remodeling, very small cavities, very concentric LVs, but not LVH, it was remodeling or even concentric hypotrophy with low LV mass and very, very uh, small cavities. Um, you can see how this would behave in the pressure volume plane. Um, this filling uh, curve will be shifted, of course, all the way to the left, like had been described in more classic half-pep invasive studies. They had very stiff arteries. Um, uh, they had increased resistive load, increased vascular resistance, diastolic dysfunction um, and high natriuretic peptide levels, high prevalence of CKD and AFib and LA, LA enlargement. So they had this LA enlargement with small concentric LBs. Whereas the phenogroup group three, the males with diabetes and so forth, um, were uh, ex exhibited a high prevalence of diabetes and CKD as well, uh, but they exhibited concentric hypertrophy. They really truly had big hearts with LV mass, but concentric, so the cavity wasn't necessarily big. They also exhibited arterial stiffening with no increases in resistive load and a lot of echo abnormalities, pronounced diastolic dysfunction by echo. Natriuretic peptides paradoxically were not as high, were either mildly elevated or normal. Uh, and this is a well-known um, paradox in obesity due to probably um, um, uh, degradation of natriuretic peptides. And, um, and they had more depression and more advanced NYHA class. And, and, and interestingly, they had the most pronounced, in fact, they were the group that responded to spironolactone. And we wanted to understand this a little better. So you know, we measured 50 uh, proteins in plasma um, using BioLink frozen samples. And these are the results. I'm showing you some of the biomarkers that are different here. This is a radar plot. I don't expect you to absorb this plot 
in a few seconds, but I'll summarize it for you. Uh, the young people what with that this phenogroup we thought was composed of people with lung disease, in fact, had higher MMP9. This is a biomarker that's been described in chronic bronchitis. So again, pointing towards not HFPA. This is not a genuine HFPA. They were enrolled in top in Russia, but they didn't have HFPA. Um, the little old lady phenogroup group had markers of calcification and innate immunity inflammation. Whereas the obese individuals, um, obese diabetic phenogroup group exhibited TNF alpha mediated inflammation, uh, abnormal intermediary metabolism biomarkers, uh, markers of liver, liver fibrosis, um, likely NAFL, um, as well as high RIN. This is important because this is the group that responds to spironolactone. And in fact, you could have predicted or at least hypothesized that this was the group that was going to respond. And if you look then, of course, in retrospect, but if you look at the prospective effects of randomization in top cut, this group, in fact, benefited from the intervention. So you could think, well, why wouldn't they do this before? Well, the technology wasn't there for proteomics. But why are we not doing this now? And I, I, I have to advance uh, here that uh, we're not seeing enough um, precision designs in cardiovascular medicine, um, um, despite some recent, recent successes with SGLT2 inhibitors, for example. We, we really had a lot of failures and, and we can wait another 10 or 20 years for the next big hit in half back. We have to be precise. And I think one of the ways to be precise here is to characterize the the, mechanis the mechanistic phenotypes in humans to target the right drug to the right patient uh, in, in order to uh, achieve a therapeutic response. And this can be done through multiple um, um, uh, designs. One of them is this enrichment design where you, where you could get uh, initial data in some, uh, in, in a larger population and then tune it into a responder population. Um, um, and proteomics and biomarkers, we think, are going to be a big tool in this sort of design. Okay, now let's talk about the role of large heart stiffening for cardiovascular risk assessment very quickly. We know that it's a risk predictor. I'm going to go through some of our arcing principles of, of this. So ACCAHA prevention guidelines are focused on atherosclerotic CVP. Um, uh, and, and this is important to recognize. And arterial stiffening and atherosclerosis are different processes. Arterial stiffening occurs in the media. Pathologically, it's different, but they share risk factors and biologic processes overlap such that aortic stiffening predicts multiple endpoints, including atherosclerotic and non-atherosclerotic CVD. And to the degree that it does predict atherosclerotic CVD independently of traditional risk factors, it can be used to enhance risk assessments and primary prevention uh, of atherosclerotic CVD. And that's what we do in the, in the office um, routinely, right? Um, so but it also gives us um, uh, an assessment of non-atherosclerotic risk, heart failure in particular, which is key for hypertension therapy. So um, it's also important to recognize that if we want to use this in the clinic, our refined risk estimations must be actionable. It's not just a matter of measuring it and say, this is your pulse wave velocity. It must tell us something different. It must change conduct. And, and for that, in order to, to apply it for it, we, we, um, we have to apply it in specific situations, specifically when when we're um, at the border or a borderline decision. And remember thresholds, according to the latest guidelines, depend on absolute risk. And that's seven and a half uh, percent of 10 years for statins, I'm talking about primary prevention, or 10% for initiating antihypertensive therapy in a stage one hypertension in the absence of CKD of diabetes. And there's a lot of the stage one hypertensives out there who don't have CKD or diabetes. And for them, or you need to do is compute their cardiovascular risk to see if they merit antihypertensive therapy. So if um, um, those thresholds are important to recognize, they could also guide clinician patient discussions or enhance decision making for intensification of lifestyles and lifestyle interventions or frequency of cardiovascular risk assessments, particularly in younger people. Uh, now, to the degree that large heart rate stiffening is structural, it can be also advantageous in special populations in which pool cohort equations may be unreliable. Hispanics, immigrants, et cetera. Um, another important principle is that large artery stiffening is heritable. It's about 50% heritable. And, and the other 50% is more environmental or non-heritable. And um, as such, it can assist in the early identification of patients at risk for isolated systolic hypertension. Remember, ISH is a very late milestone. It's a disease of the elderly. You don't want to know 
um, that your aorta is stiff when your systolic is 160 or 150. You want to know way before that so that you can implement appropriate um, interventions or at least uh, for now life uh, life uh, style interventions or um, hopefully in the future um, um, pharma pharmacologic interventions. But anyway, going to today's scenarios, these are the clinical situations in which we believe large artery stiffening may guide decision making. And these have been embedded in the current guidelines. So we're not saying like, some people do is well just measure pulse wave velocity in everybody and this needs to be at the center of cardiovascular risk prevention that's just not going to work because people follow these guidelines these are the guidelines that we work under so if we want to incorporate these measurements they have to be um, in tune with this and these are the scenarios i'm not going to go through them in, in great detail but as you can imagine it's really those scenarios in the current guidelines in which there's borderline decision making such as seven and a half percent risk um for initiation of status. If you're right there at seven and a half, do you flip it to nine or to five? Do you initiate or not? That's one situation in which a large heart chest stiffening uh, metrics could help. Similarly, if you have a stage one hypertensive with an estimated risk without diabetes or CKD with an estimated risk of 10%, same situation. Assessment of cardiovascular risk in special populations where your PCE equations are really not reliable. Uh, you may want to take a look at pulse wave velocity. And if, if it's increased for age, that supports that the patient is, in fact, at increased cardiovascular risk. Um, the other interesting scenario is stage two isolated systolic hypertension in very young people. There's something called a pseudo hypertension of the young, um, tall, thin people who have a high pulse pressure in the arm, high systolic, no risk factors, no target organ damage. You measure the aortic pulse pressure and it's is small. The aortic systolic is low. It all depends on ampli excessive amplification of the pulse in the arm. Um, um, and so when you're suspecting this, it may be worth measuring large artery stiffening and central pressures to, to make sure that, that, that this is just um, excessive amplification. And in those scenarios, you may uh, very carefully consider withholding therapy, but you have to be absolutely sure that this is just amplification in the arm and that your target organs are okay and that your aorta is not stiff because you don't want to miss true uh, systolic hypertension at the end. Um, um, finally, non-hypertensive adults less than 40 years of age with family histories. Uh, again, going back to that curve, we want to catch these people early. Very good. So that's, that's how you could use them in the clinic, but how would you measure it in the clinic? Well, the short answer is pulse wave velocity. This is the most well-validated metric. A carotid femoral is what we consider the reference method. You put a tonometer or an ultrasound uh, device in the carotid and femoral, and you measure the delay, you measure the distance, and you have a velocity. Uh, it's important to recognize that uh, this is not a true carotid femoral travel because the pulse is traveling up the carotid and down the femoral uh, at the same time. And it also misses the aortic root, which may be the, the earliest uh, segment to stiffen with aging. So it's not perfect, but it's what's been used in most of the studies, and we have very good normative data. Uh, yet again, this, the ascending aorta is missed, missed by this technique. So um, this is what it would look like. This is a carotid femoral pulse wave velocity recording with a tonometry system. We have the ECG and you measure the carotid and the femoral and the, the software in the device computes the delay between both. You can use a vascular probe with an ECG um, and with your echo machine. If you have a vascular probe in it, you get the ECG, you get the carotid, the femoral, and you just grab your calipers, your digital calipers and measure the delay. And you have exactly the same thing. Um, so you don't need a a dedicated tonometry system for this in the clinic. If you have a good ultrasound machine, that's all you need. You could even do it at the bedside, um, and you know, in, in, in portable uh, in a portable way. Um, and uh, we're investigating other ways to assess this with echo, looking at the root uh, pulse with you know the pulse wave Doppler in, in the echo lab at the supersternal views, abdominal aorta, etc. We're even doing this retrospectively in our biobank, trying to get pulse wave velocities in multiple people going back. Uh, we're going to get, I don't know, uh, probably uh, 50,000 people and, and they have genomic data. And what we're trying to do here is look at SNPs that may relate to aortic stiffening. Uh, but uh, what I want to tell you here is this is doable, even in retrospect, as long as you have the primary Doppler acquisitions, you do need to know the aortic length and we're developing formulas for that. We're even developing some AI um, algorithms to automatically segment the flow and extract the ECG signal so that... Uh, it can be immediately measured automatically without even having to do the, the caliper measurements manually. And you can see that this would be advantageous to do thousands of tens of thousands of, uh, of measurements in biobanks and such.
There are now some other machines that measure um, pulse wave velocity exclusively using cuffs, no need for tonometry or ultrasound. You just need a PCG sensor to time the cardiac sounds and you need um, cuffs in the arm and the ankle. Uh, we've applied this in the MESA study. We still don't know how well it's gonna pan out in the US. It, it did work to predict cardiovascular risk in Asia. Uh, we'll see if this works. It would be good because it's very easy to acquire uh, with just putting four cuffs around the limbs. About uh, pathophysiology now, we'll talk very quickly. Multiple mechanisms, elastin fragmentation, collagen deposition, cross-linking of collagen and, and, uh, and elastin, vascular mus muscle cell stiffening, calcification, and the theal dysfunction and inflammation. Several um, of these mechanisms interact. They're um, um, summarized in this table in this review from Jack a couple of years ago, in case you're interested. We won't spend too much time, but I'll spend some time talking about vitamin K dependent activation of NGP, which is an interesting protein that's carboxylated and phosphorylated. Uh, and um, it's a potent inhibitor of uh, vascular calcification. When it doesn't get carboxylated, uh, it goes in, it's excreted into the plasma and you can measure it. It's called the DPUCMGP. Very interesting biomarker of vitamin K uh, deficiency in the vascular wall. Mice that lack this gene or they have a knockout, yeah, knockout mice that lack this gene are born with calcified aortas and calcified tracheas. So it, it must be present to actively inhibit calcification. We've correlated uh, this with pulse wave velocity, carotid pulse wave velocity, multiple populations in diabetes, hypertension, and CKD. I don't want to spend too much time. All these studies are pointing in the same direction. There's an independent relationship between this biomarker and um, pulse wave velocity. We've done the same in heart failure. We've shown that this biomarker is increased in both half PEF and half ref, that it correlates positively and independently with pulse wave velocity. And interestingly, warfarin users exhibited very high levels of this DPUCMGP. As you would imagine, warfarin also inhibits vascular vitamin K dependent carboxylation, not only in the liver for coagulation factors, but also in the arterial wall. And this was related in pathway analysis to aortic stiffening. And this goes along very much with the previous data showing that warfarin leads to calcification of the aorta. There are very beautiful studies with serial radiographs of abdominal aortas where you can see this. Um, um, now, let's think about uh, some other pathways to impact aortic stiffening. NO is huge, uh, targeting the muscular arteries uh, with NO donors or downstream pathways to compensate for aortic stiffening is an interesting approach. We tried organic nitrates, didn't work. In fact, it didn't reduce wave reflection at all. If anything, it inclu increased wave reflection, for probably through oxidative stress. It didn't improve LV fibrosis, if anything it increased LV fibrosis at, at, at six months. So really disappointing um, trials uh, with uh, organic nitrate. What we did see is a huge incidence of side effects, specifically headache compared to placebo. So really bad approach. Now, more recently, we've been thinking about this other NO pathway, the nitrate nitrite and NO. Very quickly, nitrate, you eat it in vegetables, such as beetroot and, and various others. Your bacteria, you, you absorb it and you start recirculating it in your saliva. And we and bacteria in your mouth reduce it to nitrites, and the nitrite um, leads to NO. Uh, it's reduced to NO by the oxyhemoglobin and myoglobin in um, in hypoxic environments, such as skeletal muscle during exercise, for example. But interestingly, there's also a normoxia-dependent pathway of activation of reduction that's been recently described that reduces wave reflection in muscular arteries because it delays their the reflected wave, which is which is fascinating. We did a single crossover, single dose crossover trial, clearly showing effects on SBR during exercise cardiac output, peak VO2 and half path, and also a reduction in wave reflection. And interestingly, in this trial, the reduction in wave reflection correlated positively with the improvement in peak VO2. We've shown that the cerebrovascular effects of inorganic nitrate are not uh, as bad as the organic variety. It doesn't produce this vasodilation that uh, is associated with organic nitrates. Yet, the in the half path trial was a huge disappointment. It was completely flat, completely negative. This trial, though, used a very short acting preparation of nitrite and it held preparation with a half-life of 35 minutes, 35 minutes, given three times daily. You can imagine this, this huge fluctuations in nitrite levels that probably led to counter-regulatory responses. This, this was not the right drug to use, we believe, we have this other trial, knockout trial using oral KNO3, lasts for a lot longer. You can give it every eight hours and have steady state pharmacokinetics, which you never achieve with the inhaled version. Although 
the problem here is that KNO3 needs to be reduced. It's not the nitrites that we give, it's the nitrates. So you need your oral bacteria, and it's tricky to maintain that uh, in a trial. Uh, mouthwash, for example, can kill a lot of the bacteria that, that uh, activate nitrates. So um, you get, uh, we think that this may work, and we're doing the trial. COVID has delayed us by a couple of years, but we're almost done. We have, I think, four patients to go. Finally, very seaward, very interesting, SG um, uh, soluble guanolate cyclist um, activator stimulators may be an avenue. We saw in dogs that they reduce reflection magnitude for several hours. We're about to publish that. Finally, we're looking at Mendelian randomization approaches in the UK Biobank and, and Penn Medicine Biobank. This may be a good way to look at novel compounds. Remember, a trial of aortic stiffening per se uh, will require years and years of follow-up. This is a very slow process. So unless we study you know, 300,000 people, we're going to have to do very long trials. And, and so we really want to go there with, with a very high yield probability of success. And I think Mendelian randomization, the, what's called the randomized trial of nature, you're genetically determined uh, aortic stiffening being a determinant of downstream risk and the pathways that are associated with those SNPs may give us hints. So we're, we're, we're trying and we're also doing um, analysis of proteomics in, in various populations to try to sort this out. Part of this is through a collaboration with BMS, a global heart failure consortium that also is looking at pre stage B heart failure. So diabetes and so forth and, and hypertension. And we look forward to collaborating with Dr. Morris in this. We've been having several conversations. She, she, does, uh, she has a great cohort there. Um, so these are the conclusions. Large artery stiffening is a key determinant of cardiovascular health and target organ damage. It's an independent predictor of cardiovascular risk beyond atherosclerotic CVD and can help in clinical decision-making in specific clinical situations. It can be readily assessed with ultrasound or various non-invasive devices, but challenges remain for its broad application. In the US, it's really reimbursement. Um, increased large artery stiffening and premature wave reflection are implicated in LV remodeling, fibrosis, and heart failure. We have some available agents that may exert a therapeutic benefit through modulation of wave reflection, but dedicated proof of concept trials are ongoing and more of them are needed. For earlier prevention, multiple mechanisms lead to increased uh, large artery stiffening but more studies are needed to assess its molecular determinants in humans in order to identify novel therapeutic targets. More research is also needed in multiple areas. Areas Again, human mechanisms, Mendelian randomization is an attractive approach. Ethnic racial differences, this is a huge uh, knowledge gap that is being actively pursued by Dr. Morris and we're collaborating very actively in this. Novel therapeutics, RCTs, um, need to be done, of course, uh, but again, these are probably going to be very long. And the last uh, bullet point there, I want to leave you with this message. Dr. Brownwell is talking about eradicating atherosclerosis from the face of Earth with novel uh, lipid lowering therapy given early enough. Uh, and if we see that, we're still going to be left with large artery stiffening mediated cardiovascular disease. And this is going to be a huge burden of CKD, heart failure, dementia. So unless we address large heart stiffening, we're still going to be um, um, burdened with, with all these um, uh, age-related disease. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, for that incredibly comprehensive um, review. Um, I'd like to open the floor up for questions, uh, if anyone has questions. I have a question. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, have you looked at uh, women with PCOS? Because you know your initial slides, as I was thinking about metabolic dysfunction and endothelial dysfunction, it seems like PCOS may be a good group. And I was just wondering if anybody has looked at that. That's an interesting question. No, I'm not aware of anybody uh, looking at that. I mean, PCOS, to the extent that it relates to metabolic dysfunction, obesity, and, and some other risk factors, it may, uh, it may have a, a, a relationship there. But I wonder whether there's something more direct. I, I'm not aware of any studies in that regard. It may be a good, a, a good area for, for research. Having said that, um, it, it's possible that some data are there, and I don't know about it. Thank you. I had a question, Julio. Thank you very much. It's Arshad Kayumi. Hello, um, I'm good, thanks. Um, fantastic talk. Um, always learn when you speak about these things, something new. 
Um, I was wondering that if you had a hypertensive situation, say uh, early hypertension, and you happen to have these results of pulse wave and augmentation index in a patient, would that allow you to select antihypertensive therapy in a certain way if you saw certain results versus others, or even in a more difficult to control hypertensive individual? Would that help in any way? That's a great question. Uh, we've been thinking about this. Th there is a reason to believe so. Uh, you know, antihypertensive agents clearly have different mechanisms of action. And we let me tell you about this study that we haven't published yet. Um, uh, there, uh, it's called the Intervention Trial. The, the primary um, aim of this trial was really to characterize differences in um, responses to antihypertensive therapy according to altitude above sea level. Um, and and this, there are many reasons to believe that just you know altitude above sea level it, it leads to differences in hypertension phenotypes. So we hypothesize that it may lead to differences in hypertensive uh, response to antihypertensive agents. So uh, what we did there is is randomize participants in a crossover design to a diuretic, an IRB, an ARB, or a calcium channel blocker. It was erbesartan against and lodipine against hydrochlorothiazide. And, and they all, every participant received all three medications in a random order. Uh, and we, met, we made hemodynamic measurements at baseline and after um, um, uh, a course of each of these agents. Um, the, the main outcome of the trial was that um, altitude above sea level does not significantly impact the response. Um, uh, but very interestingly, in that trial, you could actually predict the individual response to uh, specifically calcium channel blockers using pulse wave analysis. And the, the, the long story short is that if your pulse wave analysis shows you a high augmentation index, you are a calcium channel blocker responder. Um, and the greater the augmentation index, the greater the reduction in response to calcium channel blockers. So this is a way to personalize therapy. Um, now it's a randomized trial, it's perspective. This is, a, this is a, a retrospective analysis of the data, perhaps requires more validation, um, but it just, I think it entirely proves the concept that you're, that you're bringing up, Arshit, which is uh, these phenotypes are going to allow us to personalize antihypertensive therapy. Um, I could see the day in which you measure this in every blood pressure cuff. Now, of course, we did it with radial tonometers, with the sphygmocord devices, and we did radial and carotid and carotid femoral pulse wave velocities. And, you know, thankfully, we had a very dedicated group of, of sites involving for this trial, and they, they really acquired excellent data. But I don't expect every clinician to be spending all that time um, doing a carotid femoral pulse wave velocity and pulse wave analysis in the office. So, We've been thinking about how to translate this to practice. And, and it just turns out that technology has, has advanced to a point where you can put a cuff in the arm with a standard blood pressure machine uh, or what looks like a standard blood pressure machine, inflated at either um, mean pressure, infra, infra diastolic pressure or suprasystolic pressure, depending on, on the device that, that, you, that you choose. And you can get uh, a pressure waveform uh, that gets recorded into the computer. And that waveform, in fact, gives you all the information you need, just like a radial tenometric pressure waveform. And so we're trying to translate what an augmentation index of 10 in a radial tenometry means relative to what you would obtain with this device to try to design a trial that will do exactly that, which is personalized therapy on the basis of a cuff. Uh, not a tonometry system, but just a cuff. So I see the day in which the cuff that you use in the clinic and it doesn't take you a second longer, you just put the cuff, press the button, go, go away, let the cuff do its thing, come back. And, um, and you have your readings, not only of peripheral pressure, but central pressure and augmentation, which may allow you to select antihypertensive therapies. Another um, limitation of this is that, of this study is that it did not in, uh, include Caucasians or African-Americans, which who uh, have probably different phenotypes as well. So we were, this was a, a trial in South America that we did. So, um, and, and of course the altitude above sea level was, was specifically for Indian regions that, that we developed this trial, but uh, we wanna develop a similar trial in the US and, and, and probably with specific perspective hypothesis of personalized therapy. Thank you.
This is uh, Cretan Mavromatis. That was a really wonderful um, talk. I, I wondered, is there any data or can you tell your thoughts on the large artery stiffness impact on the degeneration of the aortic valve? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So you, you're, I guess there are a few things about the aortic valve and the aortic wall. So the aortic valve does share some uh, similarities with the proximal aorta so, so that I mean, you can even see this in the echo lab, especially calcification. Sometimes, you know, people calcify the valve and the root together. And you can imagine that's just a terrible situation for the LV because the root's all stiff and the characteristic impedance is, is all stiff um, and so forth. So, and, and there are mechanisms that, that impact stiffening and calcification in parallel. Uh, MGP, the pathway I just discussed, this vitamin K dependent is one of them. Um, so, um, uh, so there's, there's some similarities there. Um, the other aspect of aortic stenosis is that, of course, the, the arteries matter when you have a stenotic aortic valve, just like they matter when you don't. And you really want to optimize those hemodynamics, uh, especially when you correct the valve. But uh, I'm not aware of aortic stiffening leading to um, aortic valve degeneration. Um, I would imagine this would be mostly impacted by geometry, would be my guess, that leads to vortices, you know, the, the, the organization of flow in the root and how this all flows and hits the valve, for example. Um, that perhaps may have a role, but that's not really a function of wall stiffening so much as it is a function of wall geometry. So, uh, um, and I'm not aware of any other really direct links by which aortic stiffening would cause degeneration of the valve. Uh, this is Bob Taylor. I have a quick question. So I wonder if you could talk a little more about gender specific effects. Um, I know you talked about sort of the elderly female phenotype, but what about the younger female, generally smaller stature, less muscle mass, and a low resistance uterine uh, vasculature? Uh, what are your thoughts about that and potential impact in, on a long term impact on vascular health? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, those those phenogroups, I, I've been I've been wondering what this is, right? Is it is this really different biology or is it just generational waves of half path? And you know, if you think about how old these people were then when they're, you know, when, when they were in Taka, they were, you know, 70 years old, they, they would have been born in the 30s. And you know, and, and there was there was they're very interesting epigenetic mechanisms, even if you if you go back to the 30s and the Great Depression and all that, and their famines, even at that time in the US. Um, that, you know, you, you have that genetic and, 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 and epigenetic background when then you reach 70 years old and you're a little old lady with stiff arteries. Yeah, but you're 70, as opposed to the more uh, prosperous, um, in quotes, times in the 50s where, where these younger diabetic obese people were born and, and they're being exposed to high calorie diets and, you know, bad lifestyles since um, very early um, um, ages. And, and we're seeing them present with half when they're 55 or when they're 50. Um, so are, are these really different phenogroups, completely different illnesses, or is this just, you know, the same set of pervasive mechanisms that just manifested themselves in different epigenetic and, you know, lifestyle backgrounds that have to do with epidemiologic transitions? You know, it's just very difficult to discern this. Um, as far as impact, you know, I can tell you increased large artery stiffening has has as bad an impact in younger than, than, than older people. Uh, in fact, some data suggests that for some endpoints, uh, it could be slightly better for younger than 50, probably because it picks up that, that, little, that little group that, that had, truly has accelerated stiffening that's going to do poorly. I think there's such data for a stroke. Um, um, so, you know, it, it's really, really hard to tell. Um, to what extent is going to predict responses? I, I do think that um, reducing a stiffening would be universally good. I think the problem, though, is that in the older uh, population, it's that stiffening is probably way more advanced, and it, the aorta is calcified, degenerated. I mean, I, those of you who do cardiac imaging sometimes can see these aortas, and they're just you know, uh, I don't see how we would bring those aortas back in a 75-year-old when it's all calcium and it's all tortuous and it's all stiff. I think the only way to, to approach that is going to be through muscular artery agents. Younger people, on the other hand, may, may actually benefit from anti-stiffening agents. 
And, and here also, you know, when you look at those aortas and, and you and you think about pharmacologic interventions not probably not being able to, to recover that, mechanic and mechanical interventions may, may be um, suitable here, right? Um, um, there, there are, I mean, I know of a group in Glasgow who's uh, very active trying to compensate for, for, for aortic stiffening with, with a compliance uh, with, an, with an implantable device that will that will provide compliance in, in, in the aorta somewhere in the chest for the heart to not have such a hard time uh, pumping against that stiff aorta. So, uh, and you can, of course, reduce pulse pressure, at least in, in silico models. So it's, it's, I think there are exciting times coming up, even for the older folks with very stiff aortas, but, you know, they're just, we're st still very early. But thank you for that question. Very, very good question. Well, Julio, <clears throat> again, I think we've um, really enjoyed uh, your presentation today. We are out of time. It's, it's a little bit past 8.30. So if there are no other questions, we'll um, conclude. And again, thank you for coming. Thanks so much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.